Carlos. ¿Ah, sí? ¿Mejor? Bueno, voy a presentaros brevemente quién es Michael Albert. Michael Albert, eh, pues a menudo cuando hablamos del capitalismo, nos tiramos horas hablando de lo horrendo que es y de lo, y de, de lo, de lo destructor que puede ser el mercado, de lo que puede ser para el trabajador una empresa, pero sin embargo, a la hora de preguntarnos por qué lo reemplazaríamos, pues nos quedamos bastante mudos. La, el mérito que tiene esta charla y el mérito que tiene Michael Albert es el de aportar una visión. Podéis estar de acuerdo, no podéis no estarlo, pero por lo menos hoy intentaremos ver cuál es una de esas alternativas posibles, no solamente al capitalismo, sino al socialismo eh, eh, clásico del siglo XX, es decir, de la Unión Soviética. Michael Albert es un teorista político, eh, salió del MIT como físico, pero renunció a ser físico y dedicó toda su vida al activismo para el cambio social. Fundó la revista, fundó la editorial South End Press eh, en los años 80, eh, fundó la revista, fue el cofundador de la revista Z Magazine, que es una de las más importantes en Estados Unidos. Y también junto con Robin Hanel es el, como iba diciendo, el cofundador de la, el, la propuesta de una economía participativa. Y hoy pues ha venido aquí a Valencia, es la primera vez que viene a España, la primera vez que habla en Valencia y nos hablará de un poco de cuáles son estas instituciones, cuáles son esos valores y qué es la economía participativa. Hablará, luego tendremos una traductora en la cabina quien os dará la versión en castellano. Eh, aquellos que no hayáis conseguido el casco o que no sepáis cómo funciona, tenéis que pulsar el botón verde. Tenéis dos canales, uno para el castellano, uno para el inglés y podéis regular el volumen. Es muy fácil. Dejo la palabra ahora a Michael Albert y bueno, nos vemos luego para preguntas y respuestas. Muchas gracias. Can you hear me? Yeah, am I coming? Yes. Um, hello, I just need to get um, a little bit of information to help me out. I'm going to move a little bit. A little bit of information to help me out to try and do a good job. How many of you are uh, football fans? Hands up. Come on now, you have to participate. How many of you are football fans? And the rest of you aren't? Am I in Spain? <laughs> Okay, how many of you are anti-capitalists? Hand up. So much for football. How many of you would call yourself a socialist? Hands up. Now that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Almost every hand up for anti-capitalist, three or four hands up for socialist. How many of you would call yourself an anarchist? Hands up. We know what we don't like. Oh, 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 look at that, it's climbing. <laughs> okay, um, my topic is uh, an economic alternative. Um, it's called participatory economics, and it's an alternative to capitalism, uh, the system that we live under, that you live under here in Spain, and that I live under in the United States. Uh, also a alternative to what has been called typically socialism or market socialism or centrally planned socialism. It's also an alternative to that and that'll come up as we, as we proceed. Um, before we begin though, I have to tell you I typically uh, feel a little uncomfortable when I'm talking to an audience outside the United States. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, it's because I'm from the United States. And people from the United States and the country as a whole sort of likes to think of itself as best at certain things. Um, and we are. The United States is best at certain things. For instance, we are the foremost producers of weapons of mass destruction in the world. We are also the foremost users of weapons of mass destruction in the world. We are the country with the most people in prison per capita of any country in the world. We are number one in many things. We are number one in the amount of resources uh, that are devotable to understanding and knowledge and information, and we also have the most ignorant population in the world, quite a gap. We have the widest gap between rich and poor in the world. We are the number one rogue state in the world. We are number one in hypocrisy. We are number one in lying. We are number one in violence. We are number one in almost anything you can name that is repulsive. Um, if you go to bed at night, and every once in a while, you sort of have a feeling to yourself, I don't really like the United States. 
And you worry that it's not good politics, because it's sort of anti-American, and that's not good politics. I go to bed at night, and I don't like the United States. Don't feel guilty. It's a perfectly reasonable response to the way we behave in the world. It's fine to like the American people, or at least some of us. It's fine to dislike the United States because of the way we behave in the world. So it makes me a little queasy and uneasy to speak to people, um, given that I come from this country, um, especially about something positive, something we should aspire to. But I'll try and do it anyway. Uh, participatory economics. How can we talk about an economic vision to replace capitalism? It seems like such a big task. Uh, you know, it's everything that's associated with production. It's everything that's associated with consumption, that's associated with allocation. It's a lot. So how can we talk about that? Particularly, how can we do it in such a short period of time? Well, here's one way that seems to, to help. Um, it's, it's to consider ourselves a set of people who actually know each other pretty well and who are going to try and create a workplace uh, that's going to be a model of how a workplace should be conducted and organized in a good society. So literally, for the next little while, we're going to try and figure out together, and I'm going to ask you for some feedback, figure out together uh, how we would work together to produce some, some commodity, some item of value to people. Toothbrushes. So we're going to be a workplace that produces toothbrushes, and we're going to work together to do that, and we want to do it in a good manner. Now, we're not just any old set of people. We're a set of people who, before this, have done rote labor all our lives. We are working class people who are used to and who have been doing repetitive rote tasks um, as our work. We're not engineers, we're not doctors and lawyers and managers. We're people who've been doing that kind of work, and we're getting together to create a new factory. Um, that's one possibility. If you prefer, you can think of us as the workforce that was at a factory where the capitalist left, the owner left. The owner decided that it wasn't doing so well, he wasn't making enough money, and he wanted to sell it. And we didn't want to lose our job, so we took over the workplace. Capitalists left, engineers left, financial officers left, managers left, and we're still here. Um, in this case, we might be, say, a factory that produces glass in Argentina, because just a few years ago, hundreds of factories in Argentina were occupied by their workforce. After the owners left, after the engineers and the managers and the financial officers all left, what was left was the people who had been done doing the repetitive and rote work. And they occupied the factory and decided to transform it into something exemplary. OK, so let's say we do that. Uh, the first thing that we have to worry about is decisions. We're going to have to make some decisions, so we have to figure out what's the new way we're going to make decisions. Uh, and so we, we get together in our hall, just like this, uh, and, we, and we start to talk about what's the way that we're going to make decisions. And uh, somebody says, well, what's our value for decision making? Anybody? What would be the most likely first thing that anybody would say if we weren't in Spain? Anybody? Consensus. What was it? Consensus. Consensus. OK, somebody might say consensus if we were with a very young audience who had been engaged in that kind of activity. Somebody else might say a more typical citizen of society who's used to voting and decision making might say, what? Hello? Democracy, majority rules, right? Somebody might say that. Uh, somebody who uh, was sort of embarrassed to say it, I guess, could say dictatorship. Somebody else might say, um, well, the best way to do this sort of thing is be in between consensus and majority rules. We should have two-thirds to promote. And you can imagine people going around for this. All right, so. Suppose we examine um, just one or two examples, and we can see if we can settle on something that isn't any of those, um, and yet in some way is all of those. Um, suppose, suppose you're going to bring to the workplace, to our workplace, a picture of maybe your parent or your child or somebody 
who you live with or whatever, a picture of somebody, and you want to put it on the wall in your little area in our workplace. Who should make that decision? Your boss. No, but this is a new workplace. <laughs> the boss left. Thank God the boss is gone, and we're now trying to create a good workplace. And we're asking, you know, how do we want to conduct ourselves? For instance, do, do, do you think we should decide that by one person, one vote, majority rule? So you have to ask everybody to come together and to discuss whether or not you can have a picture on the wall of your mate or whatever, and we're going to vote on it majority rule. Do you think that makes any sense? Hello? Yeah, I, I would like Oh, the, ah. <laughs> It does make sense? Yeah? yeah? I don't know. What, is, what do other people think? Uh, yeah? All right, yeah? No, it's my decision. Your decision. Yeah. You should make it. Yeah. All by yourself. Yeah. Steadfast and strong. Like Stalin. <laughs> my picture is my decision. Like Stalin. Uh -huh. it's my place. Don't be a coward about it. Like Stalin, you're making the decision unilaterally, dictatorially, and you should. Okay? Don't you don't have to be afraid? I'll let you know if I'm trying to trap you. Okay. So so it's perfectly reasonable that this type of decision should be made unilaterally, essentially dictatorially, right? Okay. So the next day you come into work. Same person, you come into work and you think to yourself, yesterday I got to make this decision unilaterally. Today I'll bring in a little portable stereo. So I bring the portio, port, you bring the portable stereo into work, you put it on your desk, you plug it in, and you put on heavy metal music. And you decide to do it really loudly, unilaterally. Is that okay? No. Why not? Because there's other people around me. See the woman in the corner back there? She can't hear it. She's in the building next door. Does she get to have a say? No, but people, they can listen. The people who can hear it have, have a say. Yeah. Okay, so actually what we have here is a norm. Norms are good things. We have a value. We're going to call it self-management. And the value is people should have a say in decisions in proportion to the degree they're affected by them. So the first decision was overwhelmingly affecting you. Only you could see it. And you made that decision by yourself. The second decision is going to affect a set of people, and they should be in on that decision, and they should have a say in proportion to the degree that affects them. If I have really bad ears and it's going to blow my head off, I get a lot of say. Right? Okay, so we have our first norm, self-management. Where are we going to self-manage? We have to have a place where workers self-manage. That's called a workers' council. So we have our first institution, a self-managing workers' council. We've now accomplished something something very substantial. It is very different than what we see around us. Right? So decisions are going to be made sometimes majority rule, sometimes dictatorially, sometimes uh, maybe three quarters is required, and sometimes consensus. Because in different situations and with different kinds of decisions, different kinds of dissemination of information and discussion and voting make sense. Okay? Okay, so we've done that. Uh, the next issue is that economies, and in our workplace, affect our income. How much stuff we get to have. Our claim on output. Society produces a giant pie, you can think of it as, right? And the issue here is, what size slice do we get? What's the norm, self-management, what's the norm for income distribution? Okay. The first norm for income distribution that any economist will suggest is the following. I have a piece of paper in my pocket, and so I'm worth more than the entire population of Haiti and Guatemala combined. What's my piece of paper? Anybody? What is it? it it's not a, a it, what is it? A deed? Yes, a deed. A deed to what? So you some pro a deed to Microsoft, right? So I own Microsoft, I'm worth an absolute fortune because I get income based on the productivity of all that equipment that I own, right? Everybody said they were anti-capitalist. This is capitalism. This is I get the profits because I have a piece of paper in my pocket that says I own all that stuff. 
since we're all anti-capitalist, I'm not going to waste any time on this. If anybody wants to discuss this one further, we can do it later. In our workplace, I'm willing to bet that while we're sitting around, if he gets up and says, you know, I got a good idea for how we should do income, um, here's a piece of paper, I'm going to sign it, it says I own our toothbrush factory, and from now on I'm going to get all the surplus. I'm willing to bet that most people are going to say, indeed, that every single person in the room are going to, is going to say, are you out of your mind, right? And we're not going to permit that, and we're not going to opt for that as our way of doing income distribution. So let's dispense with that. The second way of doing income distribution is a common and familiar way, and it's supported by, and even studied by, and sort of analyzed by, and appreciated by, graduates of business schools. Um, it's operative in market systems. It's also appreciated by a fellow from the United States who you may know, uh, Al Capone. People know his name? Famous thug killer murderer from the 20s in the United States. Um, Al Capone was once interviewed, and the interviewer asked Al Capone, how do you feel about the United States? And Al said, I love America. And the interviewer said, well, why? And Al said, because in the United States, you get to keep what you can take. That's the second norm. If you're strong enough to keep it, to take it, you can keep it. Bargaining power. If you have a stronger union, you get more income. If you have a weaker union, you get less income. If you're a man in a sexist society, you have more bargaining power than women, you get more income. If you're a woman, you have less bargaining power than men. You get less income. If you have a monopoly on various kinds of assets, you, you uh, benefit from that. So if you have a monopoly on, on medical information and knowledge and equipment, then as a doctor, you get a high income. If what you have is easily replicable and other people have it too, and you don't have that bargaining power, you get a low income. Now, I'm going to assume that nobody in here thinks that in our new economy, we should have a thug's norm, a norm that those who have the most power get to take most of the income. I doubt that anybody is going to say that in our workplace, what we want to do is establish that we'll wrestle for it, and whoever wins the wrestling matches will get the highest salary, and whoever loses will get the lowest salary, or whoever has you know, the biggest weapons at home, or whoever is able to, et cetera, et cetera. We're all going to laugh at that as a norm and eliminate it. So let's move on. Third possible norm is very widely appreciated and liked by socialists. This is a norm, unlike the first two, that lots of people on the left um, uh, celebrate and advocate. And this norm says this. You should get back as your income as your claim on social product, as the amount of stuff that you can buy, an amount that is proportional to, or for the sake of discussion, we can say equal to, the amount that you produce by your own labors. Right? So if I produce by my own labors a lot of toothbrushes, and they're worth this much, then I should get back this much, not in toothbrushes, but in income so that I can get food and clothes and, and whatever else it is I want, equal in value to the amount that I produced. That's the norm. The argument for it goes like this. If I produce this much value and I get less, it means somebody else got some of what I produced. And that's not fair. So that's not good. If I produce this much value and I get more, well, then that means I got some that somebody else produced. And that's not fair. So it has to be the only fair thing is that we all get back the amount that we produced. Okay? That's the norm. It's widely accepted and adopted by socialists. How many people in here think it sounds pretty good? Maybe we should do it in our workplace. Hands up. Does this group need coffee or what? Hmm? What do you say? Yeah, 
It's hard to measure whether you... Would yeah, but, okay. but that's a different question. Supposing that we can measure it, right, should we get back an amount equal to the amount that we produced? Is that a reasonably good norm? This is serious, folks. We're establishing a workplace here, right? We are those Argentine workers who, if we don't do a good job at this, we're screwed, right? We have to do a good job. So take it seriously, and, and we have to try and figure out how we're going to do this. If you don't, if you don't like, yeah, if you don't like that analogy, then we're getting together and producing, creating our own workplace right here in Spain. And we have to decide how we're going to construct our workplace, right? And this is a possibility. We ruled, we ruled out. Es en la empresa se ah, se reparte entre todos los trabajadores, tanto has creado, o sea, tanto oh. se ha vendido tal producto, pues se reparte, se divide y ya está. Bullshit. Yeah. Okay, he's saying everybody should receive the same amount. That's one possible norm. We all just get the same amount. Another possible norm, we haven't gotten to that norm yet. I didn't ask what we should get. I asked how do we feel about the norm that you get back an equivalent to what you produced, okay? How many people think that's a good idea? Hands up. And the rest think it isn't a good idea. How many think it isn't a good idea? How many don't know how to think? <laughs> All right, okay. Um, next step. How many people think that uh, Rafa Nadal, when he earns $20 million next year, will have been overpaid for playing tennis? Hands up. How many think he will have been underpaid for playing tennis? One hand. We have one socialist in the room. Because if we remunerate, if we give people income based on the value of the product that they, that they do by their work, Nadal's tennis is so appreciated and so enjoyed by people all over the world who like to watch it that it's worth way more than $20 million a year. Right? Some of it goes to the TV networks. Some of it goes to Nike sneakers. Some of it goes to the manufacturers of the tennis rackets because they have the power to take it. Nadal only has enough power to take 20 million worth. But most of us think that's way too much, right? In fact, all but one of us think that was way too much. So we have something against the idea, seemingly, right, that people should get back an equivalent to the amount that they produce. Let's look at another example. The, no. Let's look at another example. The two of you go out in, or the two of you, you've already spoken. The two of you go out into the field to cut sugar cane. It's a Cuban example. So you go out into the field to cut sugar cane, and you are 6'4", 240 pounds, and as strong as an ox. You are 5'8", quite spindly, topple a little bit in the breeze, not too strong, okay? You cut this much sugar cane, because you're so strong, you cut this much sugar cane, should we pay you this much income and pay you this much income? By the socialist norm, we should, because that's how much you contributed to the social product by your labor, okay? So if we do that, we're rewarding you for being stronger. The next day, you go out into the field, you take some equipment with you, you take some not so good equipment with you. You have really good stuff for cutting the cane, you have not so good stuff. So you cut this much, and now this time you cut this much. Should you get twice as much income because you were lucky enough to have better equipment? This is not a right and a wrong answer. This is a matter of our values, of what we think ought to be the case, of what norm we think ought to determine how much income we get. If we believe in the socialist norm I mentioned earlier, then yes, if you have better tools and you cut more, you get more income. If not, then maybe not. Okay, 
<clears throat> what's a possible different norm that we might advocate if we don't like any of the ones so far? We could remunerate for the duration of work, how long you work. We could remunerate for the intensity of work, how hard you work. And we could remunerate for the onerousness of the conditions under which you work. And just for that, as long as you're doing socially productive labor. Okay? So, if you work longer, you make some more. If you work harder, you make some more. If you work under work, worse conditions, you get paid more. As long as you're doing something that's socially valuable. But that's it. You don't get more because you produced more output, because you were lucky in, in the genetic lottery. You were strong, or you have Frank Sinatra's voice, or you have Rafa Nadal's reflexes. You don't get more for that. You get more for the reasons that I said. Now, if we do that, um, uh, the two of you are, or you're a surgeon, okay? A surgeon? No. In make believe, you're a surgeon, okay? I can't read minds. I don't know what people's. All right, you're a surgeon, and you work in a coal mine, okay? Or if you don't like coal mines, you can be flipping hamburgers, one or the other, in McDonald's, and you're a surgeon. Who earns more? Who earns more if we do bargaining power as the norm by which we're going to remunerate people? The surgeon. The surgeon has way more bargaining power. Why does the surgeon have way more bargaining power? You see, what the fact that we have a hard time answering these questions says is that we live in a society, and it's identical in the United States, in which we know a whole lot about a whole lot of things and almost nothing about the things that really determine the character of our lives. Who earns more, the surgeon? What, how does the surgeon have more power? It's because the surgeon has a monopoly on medical information that we need. And they protect it vigorously. They retain that monopoly, and they keep the number of people who has it relatively low. They do that by keeping down the number of people who can go to medical school, by keeping the price to get into medical school high, by preventing nurses from learning more. Right? These are the kinds of things that the doctor does to retain that very high income. OK, but the doctor has a very high income, and the, and the uh, uh, coal miner has much less. What if we change to the norm that I proposed, where the only thing we remunerate for is not power, but duration of work, intensity of work, and onerousness of the conditions of work? Okay? Who works longer? Well, we don't know. Let's say they work the same length of time. It's false. Nine times out of ten, the coal miner works longer. But we'll make believe they work the same length of time. Who works harder? Miner. The miner. Uh, I mean, for those who don't know that, go out in the world and look around. The miner works way harder. Who works under much worse conditions? Miner. The miner. So who earns more? Who earns more? The miner. We just said you earn more if you work under worse conditions. You earn more if you work more intensely. You earn more if you work longer. The miner earns more than the doctor. Right? If we use the norm that I'm proposing, we should use in our workplace. OK? What's wrong with this norm? Why would somebody say, it doesn't have to be what you yourself believe, why would somebody say, this is a bad idea, this is a bad norm? But what's the effect going to be on society? What's the bad effect on society if we adopt this norm? People won't go to study or go to university. People won't become doctors, right? That's what all the economists will tell us. And that's what most people believe. That if it's the case that you, that you earn more as a coal miner or as somebody who cleans bedpans than you earn as a doctor, nobody will want to go to medical school and become a doctor. Okay? And if that's true, it's a big problem. Right? It would mean my norm means we're all going to die, and therefore is not a very good norm. So let's test it and make sure that what they tell us is true or discover that it's false. 
So we're back to the two of you. And you're both getting out of high school. Okay? You're just about to get out of high school, and so you're about to embark on life. And you're headed for being a surgeon. Um, so that means you're going to go to medical school, I mean, you're going to go to college, medical school, be an intern, and become a surgeon. And you're going to earn $600,000 a year once you're a surgeon. Okay? You're going straight from high school into the coal mine. So you're not going to college, you're not going to medical school, you're not going to be an intern, and you're going to earn $60,000 a year. Okay, so this is what The Economist is telling us. The Economist is saying that she believes that being in college is so much more difficult, so much more hurtful, so much more painful than being in a coal mine for the same four years, and that being in medical school is so much more painful than being in a coal mine for those two years, and being an intern is so much more painful than being in a coal mine for those two years, that we have to pay her 600,000 euros a year instead of 60,000 euros a year, or she will switch. She won't want to be a doctor because she'll feel that she's not getting enough. So let's test that. Does anybody see where this is going? We'll test it. I'm going to start to drop your salary, okay? I'm going to start to reduce your salary. You tell me when you're going to not go to college and go straight to the coal mine, not go to medical school because you'd rather be in the coal mine getting black lung disease, not be an intern but instead be in the coal mine, and then not be a surgeon but instead be a coal miner, right? How low do I have to bring that salary before you're willing to do that, before you choose to do that, right, as compared to becoming a surgeon? 500,000 euros, 400,000 euros, 300,000, oh, 300,000 euros. It's not hard. 200,000 euros, 100,000 euros, 70,000 euros, 60,000 euros. Really? At 60,000 euros, you'd rather be in... Ah, see, the, all right, what she is doing is the exact same thing that everybody does in this experiment. I do this in American audiences. For some reason, they're a little more lively than Spanish audiences. So when I describe the norm that I will remunerate um, uh, for effort and sacrifice, that we should remunerate for duration, intensity, and onerousness, they're all laughing hysterically at me. And they think, how stupid this speaker is. You know, who's the moron on the staff who brought this idiot in? Because they know that it would mean nobody would become a doctor. And then we do this little experiment. And when it gets down to the same salary as the coal miner, they invariably pause. Of course, we've already proven the economists to be ridiculous. They pause and they think for a minute, and then they say, actually, I'm okay with it going lower, keep going. And then they ask, how low is the lowest amount of money I can survive on? And they want to know what that figure is, because they're willing to go that low before they'll switch from being a surgeon to being a coal miner. And so what we've discovered is that what the economists tell us is just a gigantic lie that they say over and over and over again until we believe it. The reason you get all that money isn't because we have to pay you that to get you to be a doctor. It's because you have the power to take it, like Al Capone. You have the power to demand it or to withhold your medical services because you keep down the number of doctors. Okay, so we've discovered that this, this mode of remuneration for duration, intensity, and onerousness is fair, and it also turns out to make economic sense. As an incentive, suppose I, suppose I paid uh, you, right? You're reasonably tall, I think, in the red shirt. Suppose I paid you a whole lot of money, right? A whole lot of money, and I said, become like Michael Jordan. Right? Can you do it? There is no incentive effect of paying a lot to change your genetic endowment. And yet we're supposed to reward people for genetic endowment. It has no incentive effect at all. 
right? So it's not incentive. It's, it, the incentive is to work longer. You need an incentive to work longer. You need an incentive to work harder, and you need an incentive to work at worse conditions. It makes sense. Okay, in our workplace, we now have two institutional features. Uh, Self-managing workers' council, and remuneration for how long we work, how hard we work, and the onerousness of conditions under which we work. And let's suppose we're all totally committed to this, right? We're all, you know, friends and brothers and sisters, co comrades of working class background, and we've shared the same upbringings and life experiences, and we are committed to having a good workplace, which means having self-management and having equity, this kind of remuneration. And now we start to work. And we work in the familiar way uh, with the familiar division of labor. And now I have to tell you a story to, to communicate this. In Argentina, in the hundreds of factories that they took over, they did exactly what we've been describing. They democratized them and even introduced self-management. They made them equitable and fair apportionment of income, basically equal except for working hard, longer or harder or under worse conditions. And they, they were excited and they were uplifted and they were invigorated and they made the workplaces work. They turned around the failing businesses and made them work. But I met with a group of about 50 representatives from 50 of these firms and uh, they were, to, they wanted me to talk about participatory economics. And before we started, I said, let's go around the room and have a little bit of discussion. You can tell me some of your stories so I know what to address. And um, the mood was very upbeat, and they started to tell their stories, and they were very honest about it. And within two or three people, the mood was no longer upbeat. It was pretty somber. And within another couple of people, it was pretty maudlin. And within another couple of people, People in the room were crying. And the reason was this. The last person to speak said this. We took over our workplace. The capitalist was gone. The managers were gone. The engineers were gone. All the people who had been oppressing us were gone. It was ours. We democratized it. We made it equitable. We worked terrifically. It was much more successful than it had ever been before. But all the old crap is coming back. It's feeling alienating again. It's feeling oppressive again. I never thought I would say anything like this, says the person, but maybe Margaret Thatcher was right. Maybe there is no alternative. Maybe there's just something about who we are that causes us to wind up in these alienated and oppressive institutions. So I stopped it at that point. And I said, no, I don't think that's, that's really the reason. Let me try and engage with you about this problem. And I said this, I'll bet that in all 50 of these workplaces, when you made your new workplace, when you started working, you had the same division of labor as you had before they all left. I said, I'll bet that what happened is somebody volunteered to do the finances. Somebody else volunteered to be the floor manager. Somebody volunteered to take responsibility for design or personnel or whatever. And you had about one-fifth of the workers in the workplace do all the empowering work. And four-fifths do the disempowering work. So one-fifth, this little group over here, right, was doing work, jobs, that were combinations of tasks, all of which tended to convey to the person doing them information about the workplace, knowledge about what's going on, decision-making uh, influence day-to-day, -day. confidence, skills at communicating and interacting with others. Whereas the four-fifths were doing rote and repetitive work that was boring, that was tedious, that tended to reduce knowledge, that tended to reduce skills, that tended to reduce confidence, that tended to limit the lives of the people doing it. And they all agreed that indeed that's what they had done. And then I said, 
Well, it shouldn't be surprising then, having created this distinction between one-fifth and four-fifths, even though you were all friends, even if the one-fifth was chosen totally randomly, that over time, something would happen. When we come to our, well, the first question to ask is, who earns more, the four-fifths or the one-fifth when we first make this distinction? Who works under worse conditions? The four-fifths. Yeah. Who works longer? Likely the four-fifths. And harder? Likely the four-fifths. So the four-fifths is earning more. But the one-fifth has the knowledge and the skill and the information and the confidence. So we come to our workers' council to discuss policies. Who sets the agenda? The one-fifth. Who does all the talking? The one-fifth. Because they have the information and the confidence and so on. And over time, how does that start to feel to the four-fifths? All that we can do is sort of listen to them and choose among their preferred options. And we're really exhausted, because we're actually working. So what, it is, what is it that we feel after a while? We begin to feel like we're not really needed here. And so we stop coming. We stop coming to the workers' council meeting. And now after a while, it's almost entirely the one-fifth who are at the decision-making meeting. We could all be there. We still have the same rules of self-management, but we actually absent ourselves. And the one-fifth at this point makes a very significant decision. What is it? What do they decide to do? Hmm? Raise their salaries. The one-fifth decides to raise their incomes. And, and when they do that, what do they tell themselves they're doing? One possibility is this. They could get up the next morning, right after they, they raise their, their salaries, and they could look in the mirror and they could say, oh my, I have a monopoly on the empowering work. I retain that monopoly with vigor. And because of that monopoly, I have the power to take more income away from the four-fifths and give it to myself, and that's exactly what I've done. Hooray me. They could say that to themselves. Or they could get up the next morning, and they could look in the mirror, and they could say, oh, wow, I'm smarter. I'm more responsible. I'm more creative and productive. I deserve more. Well, 99 out of 100 times, they're going to say the latter. Only Hannibal Lecter would admit to the former. You know, all right, forget that one. They're going to say the, the latter. They're going to say they deserve it. And it gets even worse. They're going to say that they did a favor to the four-fifths. They, they may not say it out loud, but they tend to believe that they actually are doing the four-fifths a favor by giving the four-fifths less of the income and taking it for themselves. Anybody want to? suggest why they could, how do they come up with that rationalization? It works like this. Suppose you have a child and you give that child a whole lot of money as an allowance. What's the kid going to do with it? Squander it, right? Waste it. And not only that, they may even feel fraught with tension about what to do with it because they don't know what to do with it. The one-fifth starts to become very paternalistic toward the four-fifths, because they see the four-fifths as stupid, as dumb, as incapable of anything beyond what they're doing. And they feel to themselves, well, look, the four-fifths doesn't have any taste. They don't have any culture. They don't know what to do with all that money. It'll just be tension-inducing for them, whereas I, I know exactly what to do with it, and I'll spend it wisely, and we'll all be better off because I'll use it so intelligently. Okay, that's the one-fifth. That distinction between that one-fifth and that four-fifths is not a small thing we're talking about. That's a distinction between what I want to call the coordinator class, the one-fifth, and the working class, the four-fifths. The capitalist is gone. We got rid of the owner, and so that's, that's not an issue. But the one-fifth 
still now has a monopoly on empowering work. And what I'm describing here is a class division between what I want to call the coordinator class and the working class. It's economically created by an economic division of labor, and that one-fifth is the group of people who become the ruling class in old-style socialism. Old-style socialism actually describes itself as classless. The ideology describes itself as the ideology of the working class. All nonsense. It's not classless. It has a coordinator class above a working class ruling it, it's not the ideology of the working class, it's the ideology of the coordinator class, right? That's what it is. That's what the problem with that kind of economy is. Okay, so in, back to the room in, in Argentina. What, what I was saying to them is, look, you, you kept the division of labor. The person who became the, the accountant and the financial officer and the manager was a working class person, just like everybody else. So for a while, they were wonderful and nice. But over time, they morphed into a representative of the coordinator class. They transformed into what I've been describing. Right? And that's when all the old crap started to come back. And that's why your workplace feels so bad, even though it should feel good, you feel, you think. That's what it is. That's what it's because of. It's not because human nature is, you know, requires class division. It's because a mistake brought back class division and empowered a ruling class. So what's the solution? What do we do in our workplace? If we don't solve this, then six months from now, our workplace is going to be a hellhole. It's going to have all the same pain and, and alienation and hierarchy and, and so on that it had before the capitalists left, or at least most of it. So what do we have to do to solve this problem? Yeah? We can try to have people perform the different tasks alternatively. Alternately? We can rotate? Is that the word you're looking for? Rotate? Yeah, but it's complicated because it's, uh, nowadays it's, uh, you need to specialize. specialize okay. But, uh, but the suggestion is that we rotate. Yeah? Um, this is always the first suggestion, and it's on the right track for sure. Um, but it doesn't quite solve the problem. Imagine that we think about a barrio and a very rich neighborhood. And we say, okay, the solution to this problem is we'll rotate. Right? One day a month, the people in the barrio get to go over here and live in the rich neighborhood. People in the rich neighborhood go over here for one day a month and live in the barrio. Okay, this is not going to change anything very much. Except, if the people from the barrio are smart, they will refurnish their houses each month. In the factory, in the factory. Yeah, of course, of, of course. Uh, but what I'm pointing out is, is that the rotation doesn't change the identity and, the, and, the, and the, the structure of the people. If you rotate in the factory and one day a month you get to be in the uh, accountant's chair and then the rest of the month you're you know, doing a rote and repetitive and boring task and one day a month the person who's the accountant stands in front of the blast furnace right, doing your usual task, it's not going to change anything. You're not going to know what to do when you're sitting in the accountant's desk, and the accountant is just going to stand there and wait until the day is over when they're standing at the blast furnace. So what do we have to do? Hmm? Break down the division. Decide the it, it break down the division mean change the division of labor? Yes. Okay. There's an easy way to understand this. Um, I like to do thought experiments. Some people think it seems childish. I think it clarifies thought. Um, it also makes it so easy that an eight-year-old can do it. So imagine that we go to another planet, um, Neptune. And on Neptune, we find thousands and thousands of workplaces. And in every workplace, 20% dominates 80%, just like I'm describing. Uh, and we also find something else. In every workplace, at the beginning of the day, the 20% eat a chocolate bar, right? And the 80% don't. And the first thing we think is, well, it's probably the case that the reason why the 20% get the chocolate bar is because they're the 20%. They get the chocolate bar as a perk, as a, as a benefit of being the ruling class in that economy. But we talked to a couple of doctors on the planet, and we discovered something different. 
It turns out on that, on Neptune, when you eat a chocolate bar, it makes you smarter. It gives you more information. It gives you confidence. It gives you more energy. It gives you all these attributes that are associated with decision making. So actually, the reason why the 20% are running the factories on Neptune is because they eat the chocolate bar. It's not the reverse, right? It's literally eating the chocolate bar that turns them into the coordinator class on Neptune. So what's the solution on Neptune to, uh, to solving the problem? Share the chocolate, right? Okay, that's what I said. A six-year-old can figure this out. Share the chocolate. Share the empowering work. It's the empowering work that causes the one-fifth to become the ruling class. Just like we must share the chocolate to solve the problem on Neptune, we must share the empowering work to solve the problem on Earth. So in our workplace, if we keep the old division of labor, then just like all those factories in Argentina, all the goodwill in the world, all the desire in the world, all the commitment in the world to have justice and equity and self-management will just disappear because the institution will overcome our desires. But if we share the empowering work, right? If we, what does that mean? It means we, we design our jobs to have a mix of empowering and disempowering work such that everybody has a job which is comparably empowering to everybody else. So nobody comes to our workers' council with a monopoly on information and knowledge and confidence and skills. We all come to the workers' council prepared to participate. Right? So that's what's achieved by having what I want to call a balanced job complex, which is the third institutional component of participatory economics. Balanced job complex, that is, we all have comparably empowering work. What's the problem with this, with this uh, institutional commitment? Why would somebody say, it's nice, it sounds fair, it sounds like it might even lead to classlessness, but it's horrible. What's the reason why somebody would say it's horrible? Think back to our surgeon. What are we saying about somebody who does surgery? Let's say in current Spain, a typical surgeon does surgery 40 hours a week, just to make this easy for the sake of discussion. Typical surgeon does surgery 40 hours a week. If we switch Spain to a participatory economy, in which we have balanced job complexes, how much surgery does that person do? Hmm? You're kind of everything. No, the, the, per, the person now is going to have a balanced job complex. What does that mean? Are they going to do only surgery? No, no. no. What else are they going to do? Clean. Clean bedpans, right? Or whatever it is. An array of tasks so that they're, on average, comparably empowered to other people. So that means if they work a 40-hour week and, then, and they're cleaning bedpans, some of it, and they're, you know, sweeping the floor, whatever they're doing, right, then they're not doing surgery for the whole 40 hours, right, because they're doing other things. So, that, so let's just say for the sake of discussion again that they're doing surgery now only for 20 hours. So our surgeon, who before was doing it for 40 hours, is now doing it for 20 hours. So we lost 20 hours of surgery, half of the surgery that that person did. We lost that for every surgeon because we balanced all the jobs, right? So we lost, we lost half the surgery. We also lost half the engineering. We also lost half the accounting. We lost half of everything as far as the people who were doing it before, right? They all have to do a balanced job complex. So the criticism is that we have a wonderful environment and it's equitable and it's self-managing and there's no classes and we're all dead, right? Because we lost half our surgery and half of everything else. What's the answer to that? If there's no answer, we can go home. We're stuck with what we've got. What was it? If the, some people do a lot of jobs and we lost the jobs complete, we have won the jobs that the people do now. So what's being said is that while we lost 
half the surgery, in other words, all the surgeons have gone from doing 40 hours of surgery a week to 20, so in some total we lost half of it. While that's true, new people do surgery, right? Okay, that sounds pretty good, but who are these new people? Hmm? Rookies. What was that? Rookies. People who earlier were in the 80%. Correct. That is to say, what we are saying is that it's people in the 80, after all, it's by definition, what we're saying is everybody does a balanced job complex. So that means the people who are in the 80% are no longer doing only disempowered work. Just like the reverse was true. The people who are in the 80% are now doing some empowered work. Doesn't mean everybody's doing surgery. I could never do surgery, right? But it means that you're doing some empowered work of different kinds. And so the claim is that in the 80%, there's enough people to make up for all that lost surgery in the form of new people as part of their job doing surgery. In fact, there's more than enough to get more. So we actually wind up with more surgery than we had before. Now, somebody's going to say, somebody who's very honest is going to say, what about this formulation? They're going to still criticize it, yeah? Okay, but that's not really a criticism because that's not such a bad thing we need to study. They're going to say something much more damning than that. They're going to say they're too stupid. That's what most people are going to say. Most people are going to say, we can't find surgeons in the 80%. We can't find engineers in the 80%. The reason the 80% are only doing boring and repetitive and rote and disempowering work under capitalism is because it's all they're capable of. That's what people are going to say. Clear? Okay, that's, called, that's what a lot of people are going to say, even if nobody in here is going to say it out loud. My guess is some people in here are thinking maybe that's true. We won't plumb too deeply for that. But nonetheless, I suspect some do. But out there in the world, certainly lots of people believe this. Right? Lots of people believe that the people who are doing the road and repair, who are standing and doing the same task over and over and over again all day, are only capable of that. And that's why they're doing it. Right? I want to call that classism. It's analogous to racism and sexism. It's equally abhorrent and it is equally wrong. Now, how do we know that? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to make a case that it's actually wrong. Suppose we go back 50 years in the United States, and we go to a big stadium, and in that big stadium, we put all the surgeons. What do we notice about that stadium if we, if we look at it that's a bit striking and odd? They're white, they're white and they're? Men, they're men. So if we, so the stadium is almost entirely white men 50 years ago, and that's literally true. And if you ask one of those white men, how come there's essentially no women in here, what is the person going to tell you? They're not capable of it. And they believe it. And it is, and it is logically one possible explanation. After all, there's no, um, uh, there's no cats in there as surgeons either, right? And they're not there as surgeons because they are indeed incapable of being surgeons. So you could be missing because you're incapable of being a surgeon, right? And everybody in there would say, that's why women aren't there. And actually, if you go out in society and you ask men in the society, they'd say the same thing. And actually, most women said the same thing. 50 years ago or 60 years ago. They also said the reason why women aren't there is because we're incapable of it. So everybody sort of believed something, but now 50 years later, we know that it was nonsense. What's the percentage of women in American medical schools now, right now? Anybody know? It's about 51%. It's a little over half. So that puts the lie to the, I mean, it's not debatable. There's nothing to debate here at all. And so what do we have to do? We have to go back 50 years ago and ask, why were they not there? 
If it wasn't because they were incapable, what was it? Well, it was because society beat out of them the desire, the confidence, the aspirations, and prevented them from getting the information to become a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer and so on and so forth. Society crushed half the population into looking like it could do nothing but disempowering work. Okay, so this is a pretty good case that it could be true that that's exactly what society does to the 80%. And anybody who's actually in touch with reality should already at this point sort of feel like, uh-oh, this is compelling. But a lot of people are gonna need some more evidence. And we can't look 50 or 100 years into the future, or maybe it's even less, 20, I hope. We can't look into the future, so we still have to give an example that would sort of make the case. So here's an interesting example that I often use, which I find pretty compelling. On that same trip to Argentina, I went to a glass factory. And the glass factory was one of those factories where the workers had occupied the factory and taken it over. And they kept the old division of labor, which meant when they were figuring out what to do, they had to fill job slots of the people who left. One of the job slots was essentially, we would call it the chief financial officer, person who was doing the accounting, keeping the books, doing the financial records. So the workplace council says, who wants to do this? Who wants to do the finances? And of course, nobody really wanted to do it. But one person, bravely shivering, says, okay, I'll do it, okay? And then months later, I spoke to her. Um, and it was a woman, and so she had gone, and her prior job had been that she was working in front of an open blast furnace all day long. She was doing the same routine steps over and over and over again, day after day, week after week, year after year, in front of a blast furnace. She looked like, if you talked to her, she could do nothing more. She looked ignorant, she looked incapable, she looked not confident, and on and on and on. But now, later, she was the chief financial officer. And not only that, she was doing a job that the last chief financial officer went to school for for 15 years to do, and she had turned the place around, along with everybody else. So she was doing it really well. So I said to her, what was the hardest thing to learn in this transition from doing the 80% type work to doing the 20% type work. She didn't want to answer because she was bashful. So I said to her, was it learning how to use the computer? She had never used one before. No, it wasn't. I said, okay, was it learning how to use the particular software that you use on the computer? Which after all is a little bit odd. She said, no, it wasn't. I said, okay, I got it. Was it learning the concepts of accounting and, and sort of what it means to be, you know, to do the accounting? She said, no, that wasn't the hardest thing. And I said, well, I, you've got to tell me. I don't know what it is. I don't know what to guess anymore. Please tell me. And she said, well, the hardest thing was that first I had to learn to read. So she went from illiterate, blasted into smithereens by her upbringing and her circumstances, reduced every day by standing in front of that blast furnace to being essentially the chief financial officer of a company in a relatively short amount of time. And that's supposed to demonstrate that in fact the 80% can do empowering work. And it does demonstrate that. If somebody still doesn't believe it, put a pair of headphones on them, like the ones you're wearing, and just play John Lennon singing Working Class Hero to them over and over and over again until they get it. Uh, okay, so now we have that balanced job complexes work, we could do them, we can generate the output, and we can prevent class division if we do that. And that's our third institutional leg, if you will, of participatory economics. The fourth leg, the last leg, the table stands on four legs, the last leg of participatory economics 
is more complicated. If we have markets along with the three legs that we've already adopted, self-managing workers' council, equitable remuneration, and balanced job complexes, the markets will destroy it all. Right? The logic of market competition will, will erode and, and, and evaporate, destroy all those innovations that we have so carefully embraced. If we have central planning, central planning will destroy all those virtuous features that we have constructed. So what we need is a different way of doing allocation that's consistent with those other institutions, that yields self-management, that gives us a say in decisions in proportion to the degree we're affected by them, that doesn't produce class division. Markets and central planning both have the opposite effects. They destroy solidarity, they destroy self-management, they create class division. So for participatory economics, the answer to this is called um, uh, participatory planning. And what participatory planning is, and I'm not going to give it in a manner that should be re remotely convincing. Right? Have to leave something so that you'll go by the book and think about it. Uh, so the, 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 but what it means roughly is this. Workers' councils and also consumers' councils. They have to sort of find a way to mediate what's produced and what's consumed so that they match up. That's what allocation is about, right? And markets do it in a competitive dynamic. And central planning does it in a top-down authoritative dynamic. Participatory planning does it without a top and a bottom, without authority, and without competition. It has a kind of a cooperative negotiation by the various units in an efficient fashion, in a fashion that gets the task done, so that the, the result is that we are able to assess what we should be doing, how much we should be producing, what we should be consuming, in a way that takes into account the full social and personal and ecological costs and benefits. Now, unless you ask a lot about it in the question and answer, I'm not going to present much more about it. Um, but um, it's certainly laid out in full in the book, and it's not particularly complicated. Let me just say one thing about why any of this matters. Uh, after all, we live in capitalism. We don't live in participatory economics. We're not going to have participatory, participatory economics <coughs> next Thursday. It's not going to get here that fast. It's going to take time to win this, presuming I'm right and we can, and presuming I'm right that we will. Um, so it's going to take a little while. So what do we need to know about it now for? Why does it matter to know this now? Why is it important? And let me give uh, two reasons, maybe even three. First, suppose I gave you, or I presented, the most powerful, moving, eloquent speech you had ever heard. It is incredibly convincing about a particular phenomenon. And I convince, indeed, you already knew, but I elicit recognition that, there's, that this phenomenon hurts people. It diminishes us. Ultimately, it kills us. It kills more people than poverty. It kills more people than war. It kills more people than anything you can think of, and even than all of that together. And, and it's it's ever present. And at the, end of the at the end of the speech, I say, come join me then in a movement against aging. Aging has all those attributes. Aging diminishes us. Aging reduces our potentials. Aging reduces our options. Aging ultimately kills us. But nobody in their right mind is going to join a social movement against aging. Right? That makes no sense whatsoever. If I said to you, come join me in a social movement against aging, you'd be perfectly justified to say to me, go get a life. Grow up. Face reality. <laughs> kinds of things that organizers hear all the time. The reason why we hear those things is because for most of the population, Come join me in a movement against poverty. 
Come join me in a movement against racism. Come join me in a movement against war. Sounds to them like, come join me in a movement against aging. For them, we're asking them to do something that they think is hopeless, is impossible. And as long as people think that, it's rational for them to react and say, no, I'm not going to waste my time doing something that has no fruitful conclusion. So if we can't present a vision, if we can't explain how society can be organized in such a way as to get rid of the problems and fulfill people's lives, then we can't overcome that cynicism, that doubt, that, that hopelessness. So that's one reason why we need vision. Second reason why we need division is a little different. <coughs> There's an anarchist uh, saying, we should plant the seeds of the future in the present. We should do that to learn and we should do that to inspire. The trouble is you can't do that if you don't know anything about the future. We need vision to guide our practice. And it isn't just a question of being able to create inspiring examples that indicate which, what the future is going to be like in the present. It's being strategic about what we choose to do. Because consider again that workplace in Argentina. Because they didn't know what balanced job complexes were, they exhausted themselves, worked incredibly hard in an incredibly inspiring way, and wound up thinking that they had failed, and wound up thinking that there was no way out of hopelessness and despair. And that was because they didn't know something important, which you learn from having a vision, i.e., in this case, that you need balanced job complexes. So a vision gives us knowledge that is critical to knowing what we should be doing in the present if we're going to wind up where we want to go. What we should be doing in the present if we don't want to have the 20% ruling us in a future economy, as has happened any number of times. So that's a second reason why we need vision. Participatory economics attempts to provide an economic vision. We could use as well a, uh, a uh, a uh, kinship vision, a cultural vision, and a political vision, some total, a social vision, and that can inspire us and cause us to fight for a new society. Thank you. Eh, vamos a pasar al turno de preguntas. Tenéis un bolígrafo, por favor. Voy a resumir brevemente las, las reglas no oficiales que hay que seguir para hacer preguntas. La primera es que las preguntas no tienen que ser comentarios, por favor. Y si son comentarios, que sean breves. Y si son demasiado largos, pues os daré un aviso. Y si os tengo que dar un segundo aviso, pues dos hombres de negro, de negro entrarán por esta sala, les sacarán de aquí, les pondrán una furgoneta y no volveréis a ver nunca a vuestras familias. Así que, por favor, sed breves. Vamos a empezar, levantad la mano y aquí eh, nuestro amigo Diego, perdón, eh, os pasará el micrófono y podéis hacer las preguntas. Sí, Michael me, ay, perdón. Michael me explica que las preguntas pueden ser acerca de cualquier tema, acerca de lo que está pasando en Estados Unidos, acerca de estrategia, acerca de la izquierda, de economía participativa, de cualquier cosa. Adelante. Ah, y so, última cosa es que tenemos que... Eh, liberar la sala a las ocho y media en punto, eso es lo que me dicen. Sí, bien, me gustaría preguntar, en Argentina, en el caso de la fábrica esta que dices que la mujer, que empezaron a hacer una división, vamos, un reparto rotativo del trabajo, eh, ¿no funcionó el experimento? ¿La fábrica no fue eficiente? ¿No fue, fue abajo? ¿Volvieron a, lo, a, la, a la estructura anterior de dueños, jefes y tal? No, en in Argentina... In Argentina, uh, 
they didn't have balanced job complexes. Oh, that's right. And uh, so I'm used to doing sequential translation. It's completely thrown me off. Okay, so in Argentina, they didn't have balanced job complexes. I happened to talk to those particular people. I have no idea whether they were able to go back and change what they were doing. Many of the factories are still occupied, most of them, and they're working, uh, but they, they aren't as exemplary as one would hope. They haven't transformed in all the ways we would hope they would. Some perhaps have, I don't honestly know. This comes up also, um, regrettably, in Spain, I, I, I have to sort of introduce this, because I know that in Spain, um, the media is very, very, very aggressive about attacking um, Venezuela and the Bolivarian Revolution and Chavez. There's actually a reason for that. It's because you speak Spanish. And because if the media was not successful in creating a mood in Spain that what's in Venezuela is terrible, you might actually look for yourselves and discover that what's going on in Venezuela is very instructive and interesting and in many respects, in fact, a whole lot of respects, quite positive. And that would be very dangerous um, for Spain. If the Spanish uh, um, movements, the occupation movements and the assembly movements uh, were making contact with parallel structures in Venezuela, that would be a horror show for Spain. So that's why the media is so diligent about attacking uh, Venezuela. Uh, but the next point is actually a real difficulty in Venezuela as compared to the false ones that are discussed all the time. And the real difficulty is this. In Venezuela, um, they actually are trying to construct a new society, a new kind of way of organizing society, and they're doing it in very difficult circumstances. The difficult circumstances are these. They didn't throw out all the capitalists. They could have, but they didn't. They didn't take over all of the, all of the companies owned by capitalists. They didn't throw out the owners of the media, the most critical media the most hostile media to Chavez in the world are in Venezuela. You may not believe that because of what you read in Spanish newspapers, but it's quite true. It is incredible what is in uh, Venezuelan newspapers because those newspapers are owned by the capitalists, by the owners of all the means of production in Venezuela, who of course are incredibly opposed to the Bolivarian Revolution. In any event, there's a big aluminum factory in Venezuela, and there was a desire to institute in that aluminum factory not only um, uh, old-style socialism, but 21st century socialism. What's the difference? Old-style socialism gets rid of the owner, gets rid of profits, but keeps the old division of labor. New-style socialism, um, they would say, has real self-management, which means it really involves working people in the, in the the, the structure and the organization of the workplace. And I talked to people who worked at that factory and who were responsible for trying to organize it. It's quite interesting, you know, the real dynamics of when you try and do things like this in real complex situations. Of course, the old uh, managers and technicians and engineers were opposed to changing the division of labor and to losing some of their power to the workforce. But interestingly enough, often the workforce would be opposed to it also. And the reason the workforce was opposed to it was because they didn't trust it. They thought it was a trick to get them to work harder because they're so used to capitalism. They're so used to the way that they're exploited that their initial reaction is that anything that's proposed must be about exploiting us. But it wasn't, and so it's a difficult struggle. So you can see how in Argentina or in Venezuela or any place, it's not easy to deal with this coordinator class, working class issue. But it's not impossible either. Another question. Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, Hay uh, ejemplos concretos donde se hayan llevado a cabo eh, experiencias de soluciones de, equil de equilibrio de tareas, pero que alcance a más de una empresa. Yo sé que en su editorial, 
en la que usted trabajó, seguramente eso funciona. Pero me gustaría saber si se ha podido eh, ampliar el círculo de empresas que trabajan de esa manera. Yeah, there, there, there are any number of um, small operations that explicitly, you know, literally say we're going to function in a participatory economic way and then institute balanced job complexes. Uh, then there are li larger examples like the Venezuelan example of the aluminum factory where they're moving in the same direction but they don't explicitly call it participatory economics and they may even not know about it, although some of them do. Uh, so there's both kinds of e e example, um, but there isn't yet anything that covers a country or anything like that. There, you know, it doesn't exist yet. Uh, there are movements and there are people who are working for it. Here's another problem with participatory economics. Suppose you advocate ca uh, socialism, old-style socialism, 20th century socialism. It's quite predictable that the people who own, say, the BBC are not going to have a whole lot of discussions about judging the merits of old-style socialism. They're just either going to ignore it or they're going to reject it. And why? Because it contradicts the position of the owners. Right? The New York Times, the owners of the New York Times are not going to publish stuff about the merits or even of, of you know, socializing the means of production because it would mean socializing their means of production. So their interests prevent that. In fact, the masthead of the New York Times is all the news that's fit to print. And what that means is all the news that's consistent with the interests of the rich and powerful. It's literally what it means. Um, they don't say that, but that is quite what it means. And therefore, this isn't consistent. But what's interesting is, is that now you can think even about alternative media, in other words, leftist media, In leftist media, there will be discussion of old-style socialism, of socializing the means of production, of getting rid of private ownership, because nobody in, in alternative media owns means of production. There's no impediment. There's nobody whose interests are threatened by that. But in most old-style media, I mean, in most alternative media, you do have coordinator class, working class division. And the coordinator class types run those institutions. And those people have an interest in not talking about participatory economics. They have an interest in blocking a discussion of the, of the real benefits or flaws of participatory economics. They don't want it on the agenda. Why? Because if it is on the agenda, and if it does attain lots and lots and lots of support, then eventually their workforce is going to say, you no longer get to run the show to the coordinator class types. They're going to say, we want balanced job complexes. And that means giving up some privilege. And it's not their inclination to do that. You understand what I'm saying here? And so there are many obstacles to overcoming class division, to really overcoming class division. But just because there's many obstacles doesn't mean we can't do it. It just means that it's a difficult task that we have to work hard to achieve. Sí, buena vesprada. Eh, Voldría hacer una pregunta, o dos preguntas, mejor dit. Una, ¿qué aporta la propuesta de economía participativa a los debates que, van a ver, eh, que, que se van a donar al siglo de Neo, en el cual va a quedar claro, desde el mi punto de vista y teóricamente también, que eh, el capitalismo tendéis a reproducir en la escala de valores, en el plan cultural, la, escala de, la, la segua propia escala, y que por lo tanto, desde el capitalismo, sin ser destruido, es imposible desenvolupar de manera amplia cual se vol sistema económico alternativo. Segunda, segunda pregunta. Eh, Més endavant, también al final del siglo XIX, eh, va a quedar claro también que no era posible... Eh, question is, try and make it as succinct as you can, so I can, okay? Go ahead. Sí, desde desde el meu punt de vista, dins del capitalisme, sense destruir-lo, sense que la classe treballadora pugui agafar el poder, és impossible desenvolupar una economia participativa. 
Al nord d'Itàlia, per exemple, en els anys 70 i 80, n'hi havia infinitat de cooperatives dins del capital. Al País Bas, per exemple, tenim la cooperativa Mondragón, segurament el teòricament la cooperativa amb més milers de treballadors, però reprodueixen l'escala de valor del capital. I, per tant, a xicoteta o gran escala, si no prens el poder, no sembla una alternativa. Segona qüestió. We'll do the second one. Yes, that is to say, it's true that if we're going to attain classlessness, if we're going to attain a just and an equitable and a self-managing economy, it must be the case not only that the capitalists are gone, but that the one-fifth don't run the show, but that we have balanced job complexes and that the workforce is self-managing. Yes, and that means that there has to be a process that elevates working people to controlling their own lives and their own workplaces and their own neighborhoods. Yes. Um, uh, what might that look like? Okay, so you have assemblies in, in Spain. And some time ago, these assemblies had 10, 12, 15,000 people in them for a city. And then they declined in size, down to a few hundred now, I think. Um, first of all, why did that happen? I honestly think that the most likely explanation, and the explanation I've heard from a lot of activists, runs something like this. Um, we were really excited. We were really engaged, it was really good, but after a while, it began to get tedious because we weren't doing anything. We weren't going anywhere. We weren't moving forward. We were repeating what we had done, and it was getting boring. In particular, the speeches by the more ideological people were incredibly boring. Um, the, the long lines of male speakers were incredibly boring, and so on. And so attendance begins to fall off. It's not so dissimilar to what we were talking about in here. But let's say something else had happened. Um, let's say, or let's say that the new round of it generates something else. Let's say that what happened was when there were 10,000 people in Barcelona or in Valencia or Madrid, everybody said to themselves, you know what, we don't need 10,000 people to hold the city assembly. 1,000 would be fine. So 9,000 will go into the communities and they will go back to their own neighborhoods, and they will create a neighborhood assembly. But they won't stop there. They will then go into everybody's houses and talk to people and actually organize. And they will discern what people want, what people need locally. And then those neighborhood communities, those neighborhood assemblies, will begin to implement programs to deliver those things. And they will begin to make changes, not a revolution yet, but real changes that improve people's lives. And federated together, they will be now a city assembly and then a country assembly that addresses larger scale issues. One of which might be, for instance, okay, the government says we're going to cut jobs. All of the corporations say we're going to cut jobs. Demand is down 25%. We have to fire people. Well, we could say back, no. No, you don't have to fire people. Not only don't you have to fire people, you have to rehire everybody. Full employment. Our demand is full employment. So they say, but if we have full employment, and if demand is down 25%, and everybody's producing, we'll be producing 25% too much, and it'll all be waste. That's no good. You're stupid, they say to the movement. And we say, no, we're not so stupid. <clears throat> we want full employment, and we want 25% less hours of work every week for everybody. Now, production matches demand. But now there's another problem. You were working, you were working, let's say, for the, make it easy, 40 hours a week. You were earning enough for your family. But if you go down to 30 hours a week, you'll be earning too little. So you don't much like the demand, because it's good and it's just and it has some benefits, but your income will be too low. So we say, full employment, 25% less hours, and everybody who earns 100,000 100, euros a year or less retains their old income. They don't earn anything less. So you go from 40 hours a week to 30 hours a week, but you keep your old salary. You don't earn anything less. The people above 100,000 euros, they all earn 25% less. 
and the capitalists, of course, get less profits. Okay, so in other words, we start making demands that actually make sense, that actually empower working people, that actually cause our movements to become stronger and people's lives to become better. And then something amazing happens. We realize that we don't only have to occupy town squares or neighborhoods, we can occupy other things. So we go after the media and we create a campaign all over the world to press the press. And that campaign attacks the media for being agents of wealth and power. And it says to the media, well, you have to institute some new things. You have to put in a new section in the newspaper. And the new section is, um, you know, um, the people's lives and hopes. I don't know what it is, but something, right? And it isn't run the way the old sections are run. It's under the auspices of the people's institutions, of the assemblies. They are the ones who are in charge of this new section. And internally, it's organized with balanced job complexes and equitable remuneration. Okay, that's interesting. And one step away from that is something that's actually already happened in Barcelona. We notice there's a lot of homeless people, and we notice there's a lot of empty buildings. And we say to ourselves, well, now that's ridiculous. And so the movement starts occupying buildings and turning them over to the homeless and demanding that the water be turned on and the electricity be turned on and that people be allowed to live a life. And then one step further, we start having occupations outside the gates of the big corporations. And when the workers begin to support those occupations, maybe they even move into the workplaces. Now we're talking about a movement that's talking about changing society fundamentally in all its dimensions. And one can imagine, not overnight, but one can imagine this kind of movement growing and more and more people understanding what the goal is, really understanding it, really being able to enunciate it, really being able to give it their own additional features. And then we have a participatory movement that can win a participatory society. And uh, there's nothing impossible about this. In fact, people in Spain ought to know that this kind of thing is possible. In fact, the biggest impediment to it is, of course, my country because my country will want to kill it every place it emerges. But if people like me in the United States are strong enough to create a movement that could put restraints on my country, then it can be done around the world. What happened in Occupy Wall Street is really quite astounding. You should notice, um, it's just four weeks ago, 200 people, 200 people went into the streets of Wall Street. So we're occupying Wall Street. Three weeks later, it's spread across the United States. It's now four weeks later. There's 1,500 cities around the world, 1,500 in which there are occupations or plans for imminent occupations. They're in 90 countries. They're starting to spread their tactics. Occupy Wall Street no longer just sits on Wall Street. It sends out marches that go to the houses of the owners of the banks and the corporations. They're actually protesting at the homes of the ruling class. It sends out marches that are going to protest at other targets, like media. It is building in its, I don't know what the, whether the Spanish assemblies did this or not. Occupy New York has created a lending library, right, for the assembly and the occupation. It's created a medical shelters for people there. It's creating food distribution centers for people there. Now they're not as desirable as one wants in a good society. But they are beginning to self-manage and develop structures that are associated with actually governing our own lives. And they see themselves doing that. If that spreads, and so far it's spreading at an incredible pace, um, then maybe we have something of really historic proportions going on. I think there's a good chance we do. I think this is one of those moments in history, and they don't come along often, um, where if you don't participate later on, you wonder what the hell you were doing. Uh, wait, we already did you once. Somebody else. Sí, yo también lo creo. Perdón. Sí, yo también lo creo. Y creo usted que aparte de extenderse, tiene que ser continuado y permanente en el tiempo la participación para que realmente llegue a darse una transformación? O sea, el caso como la bicicleta, que si dejas de pedalear, te caes. ¿Lo ha entendido? ¿Qué? Oh. 
yeah. Um, if, I'm, if I'm understanding you right, it is a bit like that. Um, my favorite philosopher in all the world once said, you're either busy bo being born or you're busy dying. Anybody know who the philosopher is? You're either busy being born or you're busy dying. You better be growing. You better be advancing. Because if you're not advancing, you're going backwards. Except he said it more eloquently. OK, it's Bob Dylan. Um, uh, it's true for movements, too, in every respect we can think of. Suppose we want to win an end to a war, okay? And we are able to assemble, the United States is the perpetrator of most war, so I'm going to do it in the United States. So we're able to assemble um, 500,000 people in Washington. And we have 500,000 people in January, in February, in March, in April, in May, and so on. Every month, we have a demonstration of a half a million people in Washington. And does it matter? The answer is no. It's inconsequential if it's 500,000 people each month. Because in that case, all that one has to do if one is in the ruling elite, the people who decide, do we continue the war or do we, do we end the war, is clean up the park afterwards. It's not going any place. There's no trajectory. If it was 20,000, 40,000, 70,000, 120,000, now there's a trajectory. If its demands and its focus are increasing over time, it has a possible threat. So if it's busy being born, it's threatening, it's dangerous. If it's static or it's shrinking, it's of no consequence to elites. Before the war in Iraq, 12 million people demonstrated. That is unprecedented in the entire history of the planet, that so many people should demonstrate against a war before the war starts has never happened. And yet, after a period of time, a short period of time, the numbers were down, 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 down. Within a few years, a few hundred thousand. 12 million to a few hundred thousand. That's a movement that's dying that's not busy being born, it's busy dying. It threatens no one, right? What do I mean by threaten? During the war in Vietnam in the United States, um, it lasted a long time. And over that period of time, there was tumultuous activism. And at various points in time, a senator would decide, okay, I'm changing my opinion. I'm no longer for the war, I'm now against the war. Or a prominent industrialist, or a, um, you know, other elite figure. And when these elite figures decided that they were no longer for the war, they were now against the war, they would often give a press conference, because they're so, such big shots, that they have to explain this change in their opinion. So they would give a press conference. And at these press conferences, it would go roughly like this. They would not say, I have discovered that the United States carpet bombing Vietnam at a level that makes World War II look like primary school is a crime against humanity. The horrendous devastation of the population of Indochina is immoral, and so I am now against the war. None of them said that. None of them said, I have discovered that American GIs are being lost at an accelerating weight, and there's 50,000 American corpses that have been sent back from Indochina. And so now I can no longer support the war. None of them said that. None of them said, I have discovered that the cost of the war, the amount that we have to expend to, to conduct this war, is so great that it's taking away from our ability to meet the needs of the population. None of them said that. They don't care about that. They don't care about any of that. So here's what they did say. They said, our streets are in turmoil. The fabric of our society is being torn asunder. We are losing the next generation. Therefore, in good conscience, I can no longer support the war. The in good conscience part is typical American hypocrisy. What was really being said was, I was pursuing the war as a, as a manifestation of geopolitical domination by the United States because it serves my interests. Remember, I'm a senator, industrialist, and so on. 
Now I've discovered that the continued pursuit of the war no longer serves my interests because it is causing a byproduct, the movements of the 60s, which has torn asunder society's fabric, which is losing the next generation. In other words, my generation is no longer willing to go along with business as usual. And so it's gotten to the point where my continued pursuit of the war is not having the aim I wanted, but is instead hurting my interests. So I must change sides. Our movements have to be growing and diversifying and multiplying their focuses in order to be a threat to what they hold dear, their profit, their wealth, and their power. And if it's enough of a threat to that, then they give in. And if it's not, they don't. And that's why it's essential, it's critically important that the occupation movements now developing all around the world, having learned from uh, uh, Egypt and then having learned from Greece and Spain and now learning from somehow New York, <laughs> how did that happen? Um, uh, it's essential that they begin to take additional steps, not precipitously, but in a steadily escalating manner so that they are a threat and can therefore win changes that better people's lives and eventually win a new society. Sí, um, <coughs> eh, bueno, en mi opinión, según lo que sé, eh, el experimento que ha habido a lo largo de la historia de economía participativa que se ha podido dar a, ma a mayor escala podría ser, por ejemplo, la, la revolución que hubo en España durante la guerra civil. No sé si, si ha tenido la oportunidad de, de estudiar ese fenómeno y de contrastar un poco si ese tipo de, de economía funcionó en aquel momento, por qué sí, por qué no. Uh, well, first of all, the reason why the innovations in Spain didn't work is because they never got a chance to work because elites of every stripe, capitalist elites and communist elites all over the world wanted to crush it. Um, and the only way you can stop that is with a movement that is big enough, not just in Spain, but in the countries of origin of that violence, to prevent them from behaving in that manner, because it hurts them. That's the only way, and that's what we have to build. But there are differences between what um, was pursued during the Spanish Civil War and participatory economics. The idea of self-management is essentially the same. Um, I think we spell it out in more detail. I don't know. I mean, I, I've read lots of stuff. I haven't seen anything that spells it out in comparable detail, but maybe there is. Um, the idea of equitable remuneration is similar, um, but not exactly the same. Uh, there's little differences, I think, but effectively. The, the idea of, um, of balanced job complexes, I don't think you see that discussed uh, in the literature of the Spanish revolution and the Spanish anarchists in nearly the detail and with nearly the emphasis that we give to it. And I do think that's important and that's a significant innovation. And the Spanish movements by and large accepted the idea of markets. They thought that competitive markets were basically inevitable um, and, and were part of it. It was sort of presumed and it was discussed as part of it, at least in the material I've seen. And that to me is a giant problem. Um, markets, I'm what you might call a market abolitionist. I think that sometime in the future, hopefully not too far in the future, um, people analyzing past human history um, will realize that markets were the single most destructive um, um, artifact of human creation in all of history that they did more damage than slavery and they did more damage than weapons and that markets were, you know, the, the rock bottom um, attachment of human beings, competitive markets. So I'm a market abolitionist and I'm even short of, even though short of that, I think it's absolutely certain that in a, in, in a market system, you can't in a sustained way attain self-management and classlessness and the rest. So that was a flaw just like those, those factories taken over in Argentina, 
had a fundamental flaw, the old division of labor, which no matter what people's desires were, were going to subvert what they were doing. I think the, the attachment to markets would have done that to the Spanish Revolution, except for one thing. I think the Spanish Revolution, had it been free to develop, had it been free to, to experiment and to explore and to enrich itself without being under the gun, would have discovered that it had to get beyond markets and that it had to introduce something like participatory planning in order to accomplish its goals. And then it would be very similar.